Hello, investors. It's Don Vandenborg, Senior Portfolio Manager with Revere Asset Management. This is how I start off all my videos each night, but this is a special podcast edition for the Thanksgiving holiday, and this is the Popsy Turvy interview. Uh, Richard, let's go back to last June. June, uh, let's see what date it was. June... 16th, actually. That was when you interviewed me. And do you know what the markets did that day? I have no idea. I don't remember. All right. So the day before was an FOMC meeting. Mm -hmm. Listen to these uh, index closes on the day that you interviewed me. S&P 500 down 3.25%. Wow. NASDAQ 100 down 4%. Small caps down 4.7%. That was the low of leg two down the day after Jerome Powell's latest 75 basis point uh interest rate hike so fast forward 17 months and another reason we can call it topsy-turvy interview is because we just had closing highs off the lows today mm -hmm. on the nasdaq and the s p 500 so uh the o'neill follow-through days from the first two days in november are uh are doing their job and leading stocks are participating too and uh, Richard, is your dog available to say hi to everybody? Because I have a question about him she, she's or her. Napping. She's napping right she's now. She's napping. Yeah, it's it's the it's the one hour of sunlight that we get each day in Seattle this time of year. So Seriously, she, she, that's she funny. Takes full, she takes full advantage. All right. Well, listen to this. I got another question for you. I got another date here. Uh, 12, 18, 22. Do you know what that date was? No, I don't. That that was the world cup final argentina versus france mm -hmm. and that was that was as close to a soccer fan as i will become because that was a great match yeah uh messi versus mbappe is that how you pronounce it mbappe mbappe, mbappe. yep that's right is he, he's the he's the new he's the next generation of uh he's pretty spectacular i guess huh yeah he's he's one of the best players right now one of the best forwards um yeah, he's he's fun to watch for sure. But uh, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you tuned in for the final. Made it made it for that. I did. You know, yeah. we we've joked around a lot about how I'm such a big American football fan and and not as much a, a soccer fan. But that was one hell of a match. And you know, I can picture you watching the watching the finals and the penalty kicks, and uh, you probably put up some uh, bar stools and a sheet around it and propped your dog up there, and we're doing practice penalty kicks with a rolled up ball of socks. That would be. Yep. my guess. Uh, Sounds about okay. right. Sounds right. How'd she do? Did she block a uh, block a few of them? She she got a few. I I can hit the top corners, so uh, she wasn't able to save all of them. Fantastic. So let's uh, let's start off with uh, how about your early years? We'll go kind of in uh, uh, chronological order here. So where'd you sure. grow up, Richard? And and what were you uh, doing when you were a kid growing up? Yeah, it's interesting being on this side of the mic. Um, yeah, so I grew up uh, right near Washington, D.C. in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, and uh, yeah, growing up, um, uh, you know, my main passion outside outside of school and all that was soccer, which we just talked about. Uh, I also played baseball pretty seriously at the same time. So uh, yeah, in, in my childhood growing up, those were kind of my taint, my 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 two pastimes outside of school, depending on what season it was, I played a little bit of basketball as well. I uh, wasn't the tallest kid, so uh, that soon uh, dissipated. But um, yeah, I, I played both soccer and baseball pretty seriously. Uh, travel soccer, Division One NCSL, and uh, also up to up through varsity baseball. So uh, that took up a, a lot of my time. And and outside of that, um, you know, some engineering hobbies here and there, and. Uh, yeah, that that was pretty much my childhood. Any anywhere specifically you want to dive into there, or yeah. So what what um, were were markets discussed much around your family, or uh, so so yeah. No, no, See, I, I, I'm nodding because that's an interesting question. Um, oh. my my dad is pretty risk averse. Uh, he's he's also an engineer, and and he grew up heavily influenced by his dad, who grew up in the Great Depression era, uh -huh. and um. I definitely get a little bit of that risk profile as well for, for my dad, but uh, no, they, they've always used kind of a financial advisor and um, have always invested and, and started a Roth IRA for me as soon as I started earning money. So uh, on that side of things, they're very on top of things, but there's so much out of the world of growth stock investing, picking individual stocks. They're much more focused on, you know, long-term Vanguard funds, index ETFs, that, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. 
So Washington, D.C., that puts you pretty close to the University of Maryland, where you ended up with college and your dad being an engineer and you uh, just kind of fell in line with that. And uh, that's what you started. That's what your major was, right? Yeah. So I, I majored in mechanical engineering and funny story, all of my immediate family, my sister, my dad and my mom all now have degrees from the University of Maryland. Uh, my dad uh, studied civil engineering back in the day. Uh, my sister also studied civil. Uh, I came around with mechanical and then my mom recently did a master's in public health uh, from Maryland as well. But uh, yeah, I, I decided to do mechanical engineering. That's kind of was because my was kind of my focus um all throughout school i was in a few kind of math and science magnets that type of thing i always enjoyed numbers uh programming um solving problems and um yeah definitely an influence from my dad there kind of a, a love of uh, building things and designing things so um yeah i i was a mechanical engineer major um and graduated in 2020 and uh, did a little bit of grad school but i think you've got some follow-up questions uh, I do. Yeah. So as part of your, uh, you know, as part of your uh, education there, I know sometimes in life, it's amazing how it works. Sometimes the smallest decision can end up having the greatest long-term impact. And for you, that was taking a class with Dr. Wish. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, about what were, was it, was it just uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and take this class or was it something that you were kind of attracted to and, and then what happened as you started going through that? Yeah, no, that it's an interesting story. So I had never traded stocks or really heard about trading stocks at all um, throughout growing up. Um, but in my sophomore year, uh, there was a kid in one of my engineering classes who was trading Bitcoin during that first really crazy rise. And uh, he was talking about how much money he was making and all that. And I didn't get involved then, but it kind of always stuck in the back of my mind about, you know, there's there's crazy opportunity over there, um, something to look into uh, later on. And as a part of my program at Maryland, we're required to take uh, a few classes that are kind of um, outside of our area of expertise to kind of try to make us a little bit more well-rounded. I took some classes on like ancient Rome and stuff, but um, there was this one class that was always really hard to get into. It was um, really highly rated, but some of the reviews uh, were saying this is the hardest class they've ever taken. Some of them were, it was the easiest class and most fun class they've ever taken. And that was Dr. Wish's um, introduction to the stock market and technical analysis. I forget the exact title, but it was something along that lines of that. So. I tried to get in uh, one semester, I think my second semester of my sophomore year, wasn't able to get it in because you kind of have a random lottery pick in terms of uh, rankings and all that. But I was able to get in my junior year. And um, yeah, this class uh, from the very first class, I think it was the the most notes I've taken. I, I had you know a notebook there uh, as with all my other classes, but um, everything there was, it just kind of made a lot of sense. And the first class is a lot of essential financial literacy, as well as a touch of gross stock investing, introduction to the canceling method, that type of thing. But um, I knew immediately it was something that I really enjoyed. And, and uh, he's a fantastic professor and has a way of really uh, diving to the subjects and applying it to how he's applied the concepts in real life uh, that really make it very intriguing. Um, yeah. Any, any questions specifically about the class in particular that you want to Yeah, Yeah. To? I've had the yeah. pleasure of uh, last year uh, doing a presentation to his class. And I, I just, you can't think of Dr. Wish and not hear the word chats mm -hmm. in your brain. The but as you, so as you were, yeah. Oh yeah. And as you're going through that class, did you find yourself waffling between, do I, do I want to like try to get more involved in this or do I want to stick with uh the engineering path that I started. Yeah, at that point, the, the first semester that I took it, um, I really enjoyed it. I spent kind of most of my evenings either uh, watching extra videos that were related to, to trading the cancel method. I watched a few of Mark Minervini's webinars that he's done that are online, um, started getting involved on Twitter, meeting some people there. So, you know, outside my classes and all the other stuff I'm doing, hang with friends, sports, all that, um, 
most of what I was doing was trying to accelerate my learning curve with knowing how to trade. And there's a contest that is part of the class. So I really wanted to do well that I'm a competitive guy um, with, you know, sports background. Um, and I also just really loved it. At that point, um, I still was kind of, I, I mean, I was doing, of course, all my other engineering classes. Uh, and I was still just thinking that this would be more of a side thing. Um, but, you know, the next few semesters, I was a TA for the class a few times. Um, and still up to that point, I was thinking of mechanical engineering and, and I even did a little bit of grad school. Uh, but, I, you know, one day I kind of thought to myself and, and kind of did a little bit of journaling about, you know, what do I actually want to do? Uh, this was, of course, kind of during the 2020 um, pandemic where I, yep. I, I was taking grad school online, which is not the best experience uh, for sure. Um, taking interesting classes, but also some that, uh, you know, it just wasn't quite suited to, you know, teaching online through Zoom. Um, and you miss out a lot of interaction with your classmates as well. And you learn from them uh, if, if you're on Zoom. And uh, I kind of thought to myself, you know, what do I want to do after I get a master's in mechanical engineering? And, you know, what I, I was doing in my free time outside of my other hobbies was trading, you know, making videos about trading, you know, interacting in the community, learning from others, uh, doing interviews. And I kind of came to the realization that, you know, that that would be so cool uh, if I could do that full time as as my job, as as, you know, the main thing that I was doing. So it, it was definitely a tough, um, tough realization to come to. And, you know, my parents were super supportive, which was great. Um, but it's a tough decision because you know, my, my entire life I was focused on mechanical engineering. That's that's what I thought I was going to do. Yeah. Um, but you know, looking back, I 100% made the right, the right call, I think. So. Well, you, you were fortunate enough to make that decision early when I, yeah. uh, I'm a software engineer. That was my degree, uh, back in 1986. And I spent 28 years in, in it, which I talked about, uh, when you were interviewing me and, uh, I bit, I got bitten by the market bug in 1999 during the, uh, the internet bubble. So, uh, fortunate for you and also fortunate for uh, two guys that we recently hired, uh, Ted Zhang, who worked with you mm -hmm. uh, as an intern, right? Then worked with us as an intern. And uh, he and Connor are also uh, excellent soccer players, as is Michael, another guy that works for us. So I'm, I'm completely outnumbered from the American football to the yeah. uh, European football standpoint, but uh, that's a good comparison. In fact, Ted was all ready to go to grad school, school and right? become an, yeah, an oral surgeon. Mm -hmm. And he got bit by the market bug during the pandemic too. And so did Connor. Connor gave up his fifth year uh, doctor eligibility in college. And uh, the two of us came on board or the two of them came on board uh, with Revere since then. So a lot of comparisons there. Um, so you decide that you're going to pursue uh, the market. You had already been doing interviews while you were doing grad school. Also, one of the amazing things about the process that, and I, I kind of followed you on Twitter doing this. I'm not really sure exactly when I started following you, but I saw, you know, engineering, and then I see you doing these interviews. You, nobody else was doing that. Hmm. You, you, what made you, you know, decide to start doing uh, interviews of, of people that were in the business? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure if I remember the exact reason. Um, I had started doing YouTube videos way back in 20, 2019, just the summer after I started taking class, the, I did the class with Dr. Wish. Um, and I think my first um, interview was the next year in the spring with Ben Bennett, Pattern Profits. A lot of people uh, probably are familiar with him. Ben's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so nice. Um, I think part of it was uh, I recognized that there was so much to learn and, and so much that people could help me with and accelerate, um, accelerate what I was already doing through the interviews. And, um, you know, I, I'd done some kind of webinar podcast classes, both in college as well as in high school. I was in a communication arts program. Um, so I was already kind of making videos. I was kind of used to that and uh, figured, you know, other people might enjoy this as well. So uh, kind of a couple of reasons, but um, 
yeah, it was definitely a pivot. Uh, ben was my first one, then Leif Serede, um, U.S. Investing Champion in 2019. I think he was my second, and it kind of steamrolled from there. And um, yeah, I, I think it's been great uh, for my trading growth as well I, as, you know, I, I've heard a lot of positive feedback that's helped uh, others as well kind of speed up what they're doing. Absolutely. I mean, Im imagine uh, how the learning curve can get cut by uh, or chopped shorter in, in when you're interested in something and you get to rub elbows with people that are already an expert in it. Yeah. And they get to tell you about all the mistakes that they made that uh, you can be fortunate enough to uh, to avoid. You mentioned that your uh, dad was, not, was kind of on the conservative side. Do you find yourself uh, kind of cut from that cloth too? Yeah, I, I would definitely say so. Um, my my challenge is always, um, you know, pushing to to put on risk versus I don't find myself, uh, you know, crazy exposed and I should be a lot less exposed. I'm much more uh, conservative buying, trying to pick my spots. Um, so, you know, uh, everybody's kind of on that spectrum of risk averse versus aggressive. And I'm much more on the risk averse side. I, I think I was talking with Arusha or I watched... Um, a podcast was hit, podcast with him and he said he was kind of the same way he was much more on the conservative side so i always find myself um i'm going to be more on the underexposed versus overexposed i much rather be out of a stock and wish that i was in than in a stock and i wish i was out if that makes sense right that's i i fall into that same category i you know and i looking back i think that once you discover that you've got a method that has a cell discipline that can keep you out of trouble yeah. Uh, the temptation is there at the first sign of weakness in the market uh, until you get more experience knowing different market conditions uh, to hit that sell button. And I, I found I had to develop rules to make myself be in the market based on uh, the overall strength of it. Uh, so back to the interviews, would you was that uh, did you find that easy? Are you more an introvert or an extrovert? And uh was, did that just seem to be a natural uh, fit? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would definitely consider myself introverted. Um, it's definitely situation dependent. Um, but, you know, in uh, at a party, I'm probably speak with my friends more than, you know, making making new friends, I would say so. Um, but uh, when it comes to stuff that I'm passionate about, and, um, you know, other people are passionate about, I can ask them questions all day. So, uh, I guess, you know, it, it's situation dependent. And in that setting, you no, know, I, I don't have too much of a problem uh, chatting with people. Um, some, some interviews, you know, uh, it, it depends on the person a lot, you know, how extroverted they are. Uh, sometimes you kind of need to have a little bit more back and forth. Sometimes they're just on a roll giving a presentation. Um, but no, uh, um, the interviews came pretty easily. I've certainly improved a lot. I, I would say so. Just like anything, the more you do it, the more practice you have, you're going to get a little bit more natural. And even watching my first YouTube videos, uh, my delivery was so slow and, um, you know, I didn't quite, I had a lot of ums and, and likes and that, and you just, you just I will, I will never um be able to get rid of that on my yeah. end. I, I, I just, it's there. I just have to deal with it. Yeah. So let's talk about how you went from starting to do those videos to the genesis of Trader Lion. Can you talk about that a little bit about how that evolved? Yeah, sure. So I had followed a lot of the Trader Lion guys on, on Twitter for quite some time, uh, Nick, Ross and Rye. Um, and then I reached out to Ross as an interview and uh, we did an interview and it was the longest interview I've ever done. If, if you know him, he, he's a rambler. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, after that, I just kind of, um, interacted with them more on Twitter and ended up doing a series that that's still on my channel with Rye, um, called winning characteristics, where we went back and analyzed model book stock moves, um, talked about, you know, what set them apart, where you could, you know, pay attention to the move, where it could come into your universe so you could potentially catch it. Uh, how you could trade it, setups, edges, entry tactics, all that. Uh, still one of the my favorite series that we've done. It wasn't very popular on uh, on YouTube because nobody wants to analyze a stock that's already made a move. Everybody wants the next move. Uh, but it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot from uh, Rai during that same time. His process, uh, he's also he's a, a electrical engineer by training, and he's very systematic 
uh, procedural, all of that. Uh, and he trades a little bit differently than a lot of the Canslim folks. So I uh, learned a lot from him and that relationships just kind of grew uh, with Rye, Nick and Ross. And um, we just kind of uh, reached out, hopped on a call one day and, and kind of talked through uh, me joining and becoming a part and kind of uh, taking charge of the content side, making videos, uh, doing the interviews as well for the Trailline channel, doing the conference as well. Uh, so it was kind of a, a natural growth and, and just started from uh, meeting some guys on Twitter. So it's kind of crazy how that can all happen. That's funny. That's how I, I got to be where I'm sitting, too. I just reached out to Danny Stewart on Twitter. And, and with Re it wasn't even Revere at the time. It was Noram Asset Management. And they said they were you know looking to possibly bring some guys on. Here we are today, seven years later, eight, eight years later. It's kind of crazy. Uh, so talk a little bit about the different roles that uh, Rye Ross and uh, Nick do at Trader Lion. Yeah, so uh, well, now we kind of have two companies. We have both Trader Lion and, and Deep Fuel. I'll kind of touch on both. Um, at Trader Lion, Ross is, is the veteran, he's the knowledge, he's the experience. He's been doing this uh, for quite some time now. Um, obviously, he was a former portfolio manager over at O'Neill, then, then went out and managed a hedge fund with a partner. Um, so he provides the experience um, at TraderLine. He does uh, his his report uh, where he provides his take on the market, uh, does a weekend video similar to the stuff you do on YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, that's published that's a great of, book too last year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and he'll be he's working on another model book for this year. He just started, uh, you know, finalizing the list for that. Uh, so that's kind of Ross handled. He he also does um, a market chat each week. Uh, which is kind of a Zoom meeting, just similar to this, uh, mm -hmm. with with our members um, covering the market, stocks that are moving, kind of an update, a midweek update to to the weekend report. Uh, Rye, much more, you know, uh, on the field marshal side of things. Uh, he also uh, creates content uh, on the trail line side, and he's kind of uh, the brains behind the operation of Deep View, running things day to day. Uh, that's where a lot of his time goes, uh, marshaling all that. So. Uh, that's a lot of his, his, his stuff taken care of. He also creates a lot of videos, uh, and there's a lot of process videos as well that are in his library courtesy of him, as well as kind of trade reviews, edges, that type of thing. Uh, Nick is kind of the, the man behind the scenes, creating a lot of our marketing material, uh, graphics, educational work. Uh, he's also done a lot of kind of psychology side, um, stuff. That's, that's one of his favorite things. And we're each a little bit different. Ross is more of a classic position trader. Rye is more uh, faster swing trader. I'm also kind of in that boat. And then Nick uh, is much more um, almost almost investing side as well, position trader, but he he trades primarily off the weekly charts. So we each kind of provide a little bit of a different perspective uh, and take on things, but obviously we kind of all share the, the same key principles. And further proving that there are multiple ways that you can address making money in the market too. So that's interesting to see all those come together. I know you and Rye recently finished uh, a multi-segment training mm -hmm. uh, set of videos out there, uh, and that's let's segue into uh, training and education. So, uh, back to the beginning where you're starting. Did Rye always kind of have the idea that he wanted to uh, develop something like Deep View? Or is that something that he just, uh, just you know, as part of the evolution, decided to get into? Yeah, uh, from the very beginning, uh, as soon as we started chatting about him, uh, there was a Google Drive uh, labeled Deep View Ideas or, or something similar to that. I forget the exact um, exact uh, name it had, but uh, yeah, that that's been an idea from the very beginning, and it it takes a decent amount of time investment as well as money to kind of build something and bring that to life. Um, so that, that's been something that we've been able to do only in the past few years is, is start to work on that. Yeah. Um, that has, uh, Ted who works for us is completely, uh, enamored with it and has migrated everything over to there. I'm learning it little by little, but it really is a fantastic product. And some of the things that you guys have, uh, put in there were things that were, I could see were missing from what I had access to. Mm -hmm. And I was probably thinking the same thing that he's building what he would want. Uh, to meet all of his needs. Uh, 
So you mentioned he's a little bit of a different trader, more of a shorter swing turn, uh, swing trading type, and you find yourself falling in more to that category lately too. Yeah, how I would describe uh, what I'm going trying to do is operating base to base, where the stock starts moving up the right hand side, looking to enter at low risk buy points, uh, and ideally ride it until it starts breaking down and and forming a longer term consolidation. Um, Rye, uh, he he didn't his his learning, and he's been doing this 15 years now. He started very young. Um, he learned some different methods and developed kind of more pullback buying methods where he'll like he'll look to accumulate versus a whole number like 50 or uh, in lower price names 17.5 key numbers like that if the market shows respect for that level um and then he's very similar he likes to ride um you know during the strongest momentum moves rather than you know sit through a longer term base so uh you know ross is much more holding as it you know stays above a rising 50 or even 65 ema uh but for my style and and i think the risk profile takes takes into account here as well is i don't really like holding as the stock's breaking down through the 21 ema uh and start to consolidate for weeks um i'd much rather be out you know keep watching it keep it on the radar uh but look to enter if it shapes up again um you know maybe that's patience maybe that's risk profile too um, you know, all that, all that kind of psychology comes into play, I think. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting how your style has evolved. Do you think that the interviews, any of the interviews that you've done with various traders have, have played into that? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, the core principles that I trade with are the same exact ones that Dr. Wish taught, uh, back in the class. Um, but his, I don't use his type of setups or entry tactics anymore. Um, they're, they're, they're more classic can slim and stuff that he's created as well. Um, I would say, GL stock, yeah, go ahead. GLB, the GLB, the green line breakout. Yeah. Green line breakout, which, uh, uh, is great. It's basically a base breakout after, if the, if the base is basically long enough of at least three months of consolidation, uh, and it works. I personally like to try to find, uh, tighter entries. I don't like buying when a stock's already extended into a breakout zone. Mm -hmm. um that's kind of my risk profile uh his his style has developed from trading part-time for 50 plus years uh so he's able to sit through that um i'm looking more for those those tighter entries vcp style uh Minervini is definitely a key influence um and then also i would say oliver kell uh is, is a big influence on my style uh he uses the 10 and 20 ema a little bit different than the 21 EMA I use, but uh, you know, people always say, "What's the difference between the 20 and 21?" And it, there's not much there. Um, and his no, there really isn't. You yeah. can you can plot it all day long, and they're they're kind of basically the same. Yeah, and and his cycle uh, of price action is, is something that I've I based a lot of my trading around. So yeah, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, you're good. The wedge pop. I can't. When I think of Oliver, I think of the wedge pop and how uh, looking for that pattern can be uh, very lucrative. One of the more difficult decisions that that i have always faced with trading is uh how long do i want to sit through something how long do i want to uh do i want to give it the chance to go a full life cycle and i over time have realized i'm i'm just not going to be the guy that's going to sit through a base i'm oh i'm watching the 21 uh and really trade around a core mm -hmm. uh it's nice to have a market like we have like we appear to have now anyway uh, closer to 2020 than anything that we've seen throughout uh, 2021, 2022 bear market. Uh, but that's always one of the toughest decisions is, is you know, how long do you stick with something? Because everybody's always going to be telling you about, well, if you'd have stuck with it, you know, this is up 500 percent. Uh, they don't want to talk about the the 60 or 70 percent pullback that some of these had before they resume their uptrend. So that's always one of the toughest uh, decisions to make. Uh, so back to the interviews, can you name a couple of like just wow moments that you had that you're sitting there interviewing people and, uh, you hear something that they say and, and it just kind of jumps out at you. Can you mention a couple of those? Yeah, definitely some come to mind and, and I've got a chance to really interview some, some fantastic traders and I'm really grateful for the time that they've spent. Um, one of the first few ones that I had, uh, and I've, I've gotten a chance to interview him a bunch of times now, but is Jim Ropel. Um, many of you guys, I'm sure. Captain America. Captain America, for sure. The golden goose. Um, but um, a, a lot of what he 
said in those first for interview first few interviews uh now is stuff that i incorporate every day especially in terms of how i'm analyzing price action but uh it was kind of the subtle details that i didn't know when i first got to talk with him so um a lot of what he said you know the the risk appetite of institution is shows up in you know the number of earnings gaps the earnings reactions that was a key thing um also uh tight areas tight areas with low volume uh you know now that's something that you know every single chart that i bring up that's what i'm looking for uh, so that was definitely a key thing um mark minervini the the first time i got to interview with him probably the most nervous i've ever been for an interview um and i it, it shows up on the video too i'm, I'm very stiff and all that uh, but getting to sit with him and and talk through charts with him it was special um reinforced a lot of the stuff that i learned through his books and and all that um Charles Harris is, a, is another favorite of mine. I've gotten to talk with him uh, a few times. Uh, the first was uh, at the at the trade line conference where I think he provided one of the best presentations I've seen on uh, trading both pullbacks and consolidation breakouts and kind of combining those two into a style. Um, it's really all you need and, and uh, maybe you could link it below. I, I'm not sure if you're able to do that, but I uh, highly recommend checking that out. Um, it, it's it's really a masterclass in trading uh, on the buy side. And uh, the most recent interview I did with him dives deeper a little bit into the psychology side of of trading. And he's had his upside ups and downs. Uh, def definitely recommend uh, watching that one as well as um, his uh, his videos that he's been putting out. He's done a couple presentations on uh, the rises and falls that he's had to deal with mm -hmm. and the psychology psychological side of trading which is huge um and how that's impacted him and it's it represents a side of trading that you know not many people talk about um you know everybody wants the next buy point or the rule the buy rule all that uh but dealing with your mentality you know um making sure that's on your side and and you don't uh go into excessive drawdowns that's a huge part of trading and protecting your confidence as well so yeah, some of those come to mind. Um, Oliver Kell's uh, first interview that I did with him, that was also really special because uh, it, it was kind of a stroke of luck a little bit because uh, we had planned the interview out quite some time. Uh, we weren't sure if he had won the U.S. Investing Championship. There was a huge battle until the end. Uh, so many you know great performers that year that I've gone to chat to as well. Uh, but the day that we were doing the interview, it was announced about 30 minutes before that he had won and gotten 941%. Um, fantastic yeah so that was huge and um yeah getting to talk with him breaking down his cycle of price action his trades in tesla lavongo that really made us here um yeah that clarified a lot for me and and his cycle it's kind of like uh you know stan weinstein's stage analysis on on a short term mm -hmm. time frame and it provides a nice framework and structure that you can use to interpret price action and it's simple when you see it, but until you actually recognize it and, and learn a little bit about it, uh, you know, it just looks like up and downs in a chart. But uh, once once you learn to apply it, it's really powerful in terms of knowing, you know, what to expect next. What am I looking for? Uh, what could be the price and volume characteristics that can start a new short term uptrend within a you know longer term downtrend or all that? It, it gives you a nice framework to interpret price action. So that one was really special. And uh, getting to talk with him was great. He's a he's a fantastic guy. I, I'm sure you know. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, those were a few that have been the most special. There's been a lot though, uh, and I learned a new something new from every single one. Um, so that's that's what's really great about it. One of the great one of the common threads of all of those great traders that you mentioned is the the they have rules and discipline for when to be in the market, and more importantly, when not to be. Yep. in the market so and then you know it, it's pretty common what you're looking for to in order to identify uh when is it time to start putting some capital at work and then uh, so that's what they all have in common what they all have differently is how they're going to handle it after that you mentioned ropal I, i've heard ropal say several several times he likes to get his big positions on and then sit on his hands and let the market I uh, just carry them, carry them higher. I know uh, Oliver and uh, Minervini are are quicker faster. to take their profits, and yeah. uh, some of that has fit into your style too, as you mentioned. 
Dan Weinstein, when I heard that you were interviewing him and you guys had those uh, that class development, he was the second book that I read back in uh, 2000s after William O'Neill's How to Make Money in Stocks. His uh, uh, Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets is just a, a just an amazing book. Uh, and, and his stage analysis and Ted, who works for us, is a big fan of his stage analysis. Have you worked any of uh, other than uh, the entry points? Have you worked any other of his um, tactics into your approach? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can't believe I forgot that one. When thinking about interviews, his his was special. Like uh, nobody really expected that. It was kind of out of nowhere, and and that was really great. Uh, and Ross actually knows him back from his institutional days, and he's friendly with uh, Stan's kids. So it was cool how that came about. Um, yeah, so Stan's framework, the stage analysis framework was one of, I think it was maybe the second class in Dr. Wish's, uh, you know, uh, curriculum. Uh, okay. So, uh, we were lab labeling stage twos and stage fours and learning never to hold in a, a stock that's in a stage four downtrend, all of that. So that's at the very core of, of my foundation. Um, so yeah. And, and talking with him, it's interesting because he's kind of sped up his style a little bit and um, he trades a lot quicker than you might think taking off stuff and finding buy points. And he's much more of a trader than I realized. I thought, I thought he was more looking for the big moves holding through stage mm -hmm. two. Uh, but for him, once a stock breaks the 50 SMA after that first breakout, he kind of feels like the best of the trend is kind of over the stage two might be valid, but uh, the part that he wants to really be involved with uh, is kind of over. Um, and, and he advised that cli his clients a little bit like that as well. Uh, he, he feels that's a little bit of a change in the market since he first uh, started creating yeah. the system. Is he meant, he's mentioned that several times, that the market is just different now yeah. uh, than it was back in the day. I can't hear his name without hearing him saying, the tape hells all. Yep. And that was a, a great series of interviews and a great class uh psychology mm -hmm. it's amazing how charles is such an open book and i incorporate a lot of his pullback tactics into uh some of my buying but uh let's talk about jared tendler for a while and the psychology sure. aspect of that uh besides the the obvious uh there are so many nuances to the psychology that you don't that people don't even think about uh, okay, well, I have a cell discipline. I can go out. I, don't, I can get out. I don't need any uh, psychological assistance. What have you taken away from your interviews with, with him? Yeah. Uh, and I'll be honest, probably uh, the mental game and training psychology is, is something, you know, it's probably one of the weaker parts of my game in, in terms of I haven't uh, done a crazy amount of work, read, a, you know, a crazy amount of books uh, to develop it. Uh, but yeah, getting to, getting to chat with him and work with him on the training psychology masterclass has been uh, really fun and, and an educational experience. Um, the biggest takeaway is likely that uh, you're not trying to just eliminate all your emotions and you know be this robotic trader, buy here, sell here, because the emotions and the sensations, whether you're trembling or whether you're tapping your foot, uh, whether you you feel a, a you know feeling in your stomach. All those are kind of signs that you can take in as data. Uh, and Denise Scholl also says, says this um, and almost create an edge around it. You can start to build, you know, what does intuition feel like? Um, what does it feel like when I'm, I'm starting to go on tilt and I might want to take a break and, you know, you know, not try to force anything in the market. Um, so I think that realization that you're not just trying to become this robot, uh, and instead your emotions, uh, should be kind of monitored and, and almost used as an edge by collecting data on, you know, creating a scale of your anger and anger profile. That's what he kind of calls it. Uh, what are the signs of, you know, starting to become a little bit stressed Then you know, that goes from a scale of one to 10 to, you know, completely out of control tilt. Um, so that was definitely an eye opener for me. And just going through and learning from him, his, his full system of, you know, that's just the start of it, data collection and mapping your pattern, but then uh, going into, you know, getting to the roots, uh, creating mental hand histories, all of that, uh, and interventions, um, you know, with- And, and that's, something, that's something that doesn't show up on the chart. That's why it's one of the more difficult uh, things about it. 
uh, how do you react to what's showing up in the chart? How do you, and, and uh, it, it, it's, it's clearly something that, uh, that I think is underappreciated and is uh, getting your getting your mental framework right. You can't uh, overstate enough how important that is. Yeah, and, uh, and just to jump in there, uh, you know, one of my I use the twenty one EMA quite a bit in in my cell rules. Um, and you look back on these model book stocks and they respect it so well. But then if you look back on the charts, there's sometimes these days above the twenty one EMA. There, it, tr it tries to break out, then completely reverses, and it looks terrible for one day. Um, and looking back, oh, just hold when it's rising above the 21 EMA. But yep. in the moment, especially because if that stock is doing that, that means every other single stock in your in your portfolio is doing that at the exact same time. There, There's a lot of pressure and emotions that come into a play. Um, so you ha really have to accept that uh, and stick to your strategy, have faith in your strategy, have confidence in your strategy. Uh, you know, sit with that cushion. Um, the mental game's huge. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think it's focused on enough. And it's something that I'm, I'm always trying to work on. To summarize uh, a lot of the, the people that we've mentioned, uh, John Boyk, mm -hmm. who I, I remember reading his books uh, a, quite a while back. And then to see that you guys were able to get him to put together a fantastic historical uh, review of everything. And my biggest takeaway from him is that as different as the markets are, they they really don't change. They move faster. He he went through, I mean, how many years of uh, starting with Livermore? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, going with Livermore and through all of the other people and, and the various trading methods that they've used. And But again, the common thread was knowing when the market's right to be in and when it's not to be, and uh, you know the the prevailing Wall Street sentiment that you can't time the market, uh, and everybody always publishing if you miss the ten best days in the market. They never publish if you miss the ten worst days yeah. in the market because you know the conflict of interest is is so huge. They mutual funds don't make money unless you've got your money in their mutual funds because of their fees. Uh, but on the other hand, we need those people because there are – if everybody traded the markets the same way, they wouldn't work. You've got to have uh, – one of the best things that I see when I'm feeling bullish is to see somebody bearish come on the TV and start talking about it because it's when everybody gets to be leaning one way or the other. And that's why sentiment is so important. When you when you get to one side of the boat, it's either going to tip over or people are going to have to go to the other side of the boat to even things out. So uh, let's uh, segue uh, into, we've talked about uh, everything from where you started, what you've gone through, uh, the guy's deep view. How about some challenges that you've encountered along the way and some roadblock? Uh, talk about those a little bit because anybody knows that it, it, that has chosen the business that we're in is it's certainly not all smooth sailing all the time. Yeah, so I, I started uh, trading uh, late 2018, then I took Dr. Wish's class in 2019, uh, and I've and been trading, you know, my Roth RA as well as a brokerage, uh, you know, ever since. Um, and it's been an interesting couple of years. We've had, we've had some really good markets, but also some pretty sharp declines. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the last year, 2022, was the longest bear market, extended bear market that that I've experienced. So, there's been been some up and downs with it when it comes to that. Um, you know, after 2020, there was some getting used to stuff doesn't just always pop 30% after you buy it. Um, you have to take some gains when it's going up. You you can't just expect that it's gonna work. Um I think some of the biggest issues that I've encountered, uh, my first issue in 2019 was buying extended from kind of a, a contraction or kind of buying in the middle of nowhere where the stocks already moved quickly. And it might be a strong stock, it might be a leader, but I'm kind of buying it in the middle of space where there's not really a spot to logically place your stop loss that can't easily just be taken out by a normal price movement. So if I had to pinpoint a struggle in 2019, it would be that just kind of buying out of, out of place uh, and uh, just getting a lot of stops hit that way. 
2020, um, I had a, a decent year, but it could have been a lot met a lot better if I had uh, concentrated a little bit more uh, in in the winners uh, in the in the leaders. Sorry, that was kind of the key lesson I took away from there. Uh, I I got Tesla and Neo and Lavongo, but not nearly for the huge breadth of their moves. Um, so you know, trading around a core and and trying to hold a piece for a bigger move, especially in a market like that, uh, that was a key takeaway for me. Uh, 2021 and 2022, kind of the same thing that uh, I was dealing with was over trading and kind of pressing the same way at, you know, all the time, uh, both in terms of a position size, as well as just being aggressive and, and trying breakouts, even though the feedback wasn't quite there that they were working, especially in 2022. Um, you know, after the first leg down in 2022, I, I was pretty good hands off, but uh, there are definitely some points um on those rallies where I pressed a little bit too hard and uh, got caught a little bit off guard as it turned. Um, and uh, that was definitely a, a key learning in 2022. Um, you know, recently I've been really trying to uh, focus on getting exposed at the very beginning of a market trend um, mm -hmm. where building that exposure and that natural breath expansion across the board is something that Ray really talks about should build that cushion for you if you've identified properly the best stocks we've seen the leaders you know rise very quickly you know this time around especially um but you know often beforehand a market rally would start um you know i might be a little bit late to to try to enter some names and then just in the first pullback to the a, a normal pullback to 21 ema would stop me out and then things would carry on without me so um, those would be some kind of looking back at the years, the kind of key learnings I've had. And uh, then I guess in, in terms of other obstacles, I've dealt with my with my fair share of uh, gap downs uh, fastly in 2020. Hit oh, me. yeah. Um, I remember that one. I think they pre-announced revenues and it gapped down 20, 20 plus percent. Luckily, I had a pretty good cushion in that one, but I definitely felt that. Um, and this mo most recently this year, CRDO at the beginning of the year, uh, I got hit with that one, that one uh, which definitely, you know, had to sell pretty quickly in post-market. Thankfully, I, I saw when I did because uh, it fell a lot further. It's now recovered, which is which is crazy to me. But um, you got to manage risk in real time. And uh, that that's been another another obstacle. Uh, you always got to, you know, work back to, to where you've been if, if you do suffer uh, a pullback in in a stock like that when it, when it does gap down on you. Well, we're mentioning some individual tickers now, and you know we've kind of discussed your style and how you've been influenced by uh, a lot of the different exposure that you've had. How about if we take a look at a couple of charts now sure. and uh, talk about some of the trades you're in, how you got into them, and how you uh, plan on handling them. Yeah, sure. So let me move you here. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yep. Yeah, so I'll talk through a few. This is kind of what I've currently got here. Um, and I'll kind of walk through a few of these trades. And then I definitely also want to talk about some of the losers I've had recently. Um, and I've gotten stopped out of some names that have moved quite well. Uh, you know, and you've always going to have those losers and you're going to have to learn from them. So um, the three I wanted to go over was uh, Dash, I believe. Yep, so this one. So taking a step back, um, right now I'm focused on two main setups. Uh, the first is the up the right side uh, consolidation pivot contractions kind of classic VCP and the second is a powerful gap up um, often on earnings and then you know either buying through that momentum or after consolidation so uh, I chose two that are kind of these earnings gap consolidation type trades and then uh, I've got one uh, Spotify that's more the up the right side uh, there's been more of these earning gap ones just because they've been so powerful. Uh, but first looking at Dash, uh, this, you know, overall on a weekly chart just started a stage two uptrend. We had this nice consolidation and then we get a powerful earnings gap here where we have a nice surprise. Uh, if we click this, you can see uh, EPS surprise, 53%. Uh, I, I don't believe it's profitable just yet, uh, but it's, it's losing less money. Uh, so that's always a good thing. Uh, but basically here, uh, we had a nice gap up, nice fall through, great volume as well. And then we pull back, consolidate. We form a little bit of tightness these two days. Um, and this day right here, if you take a look, uh, we break below this low. 
um, and close right near lows. So what's your expectation the next day after a bar like this? Probably that it fall, falls through to the downside, you know, it's going to fill this gap, uh, whatever. Um, but instead, the next day, which is uh, November 10th, uh, we get a yeah, slight gap up and decent action. I believe the, the overall market uh, had a nice upside reversal or expectation breaker on this day, and we refuse to push lower. Uh, so I put this on my radar, my focus list, and the next day we had a slight gap down, uh, bought it you know, through the, these, these highs that kind of formed my pivot here. And that's kind of what I look to do with these earnings gaps that then consolidate. I try to find a tight area after it consolidates and try to buy as it pushes higher. And uh, hopefully it breaks through the highs and continues to uh, trend nicely, which so far this one is working. Um, and uh, I initially- That gap up, yeah. that gap yeah. up day on November 1st, that corresponded with that uh, the NASDAQ follow through day after the uh, FOMC. And then that next day follow through was when the S&P and the NASDAQ uh, had a subsequent follow through day. Do you ever buy them on their gap up or do you always pretty much wait for uh, a consolidation afterwards? I've had more success with waiting for a consolidation. Um, I have bought day two on a, on a few different names. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking into this setup a little bit more. This is one of Ray's bread and butter setups, but I find I found more um, success simply with waiting for some type of, you know, mini base to form almost and a pivot to form out. Uh, and then looking to buy as it kind of reconfirms upwards. Because uh, then you kind of have the proof of the stock that it's going to hold here because we, we weren't able to push lower. We get an expectation breaker, and then we continue up through this point. And you can kind of manage risk a little bit tighter. If you, if you buy on day two, you can certainly manage risk at the high volume close or the low of the day. But, you know, with the, these huge gaps, they can pull back uh, pretty easily and, and stop you out. So I, I have a little bit more confidence after consolidation uh, after these earning gaps, if that makes sense. And that shakeout day that you mentioned in the close below, how many yeah. people had their stop set right below the lows of that gap up day? So exactly, uh, the, exactly. fo the follow through strength the next day is sort of an indication that uh, that got out all the weak hands, everybody that had their stop set right there. And uh, that got rid of the sellers and uh, the buyers take over from there. And certainly having the market wins at our back uh, doesn't hurt either. Yeah, for sure. And and I know a lot of people like to ask, you know, how did you manage your stop loss? How did you manage your risk? Uh, I bought pretty much through these highs. I think uh, 88.53 is my cost on this day. Uh, I initially often have my stop at the low of the day, uh, but now that it's pushed higher, formed another mini consolidation and a decent close today, we'll see if this holds. I've moved up my stop, so I'm in the money now, and it's under this low here. This red line is kind of where I'm managing my risk at this point. And I'll probably stick it here until we confirm higher. And ideally, the 21 EMA kind of rises and meets this line. And then um, I switch to my kind of longer term sell rules, which is two closes, two definitive closes below the 21 EMA is kind of my the where I want to sell the last piece. Uh, so I always I always find and, and it's one of the most helpful things, you know, how are people managing risk? Uh, that's kind of how I, I manage this risk at the at the start here, stop below the day. As soon as we pushed up, form this consolidation, move this so I'm guaranteed uh, some profit, even if this returns and, and uh, you know, undercuts this low. We've got about eight names over there on your list. What is yeah. the what is the maximum number of positions that you're comfortable holding? It's about this. So um, I, I, I ideally want to hold uh, eight names or less uh, and be concentrated. Um, I found if I'm in too little stocks, um, it doesn't quite work out for me. I, I want a little bit of wiggle room there. Uh, but, you know, I've kind of gone from 12 to 10 to now eight is a, a good sweet spot for me. Um, my starter position size uh, during a strong market is about 15%. Um, I started with the first few positions, this move up. Uh, the first were in Adobe and Spotify. Uh, I go 5%, 8%. And then when things are working, then I'll go to 12 and a half percent and kind of 15% is kind of the max initial uh, position that I want to put on at, at any given time. And uh, so you, you said you're buy, you, you don't buy 15% all at once. You said you're five, eight. No. So uh, I, what, I do. I, I'll put on your first buy will be 15% size. Yeah. But not, not at the very beginning of a rally. It has to prove a little bit. I'll start with a 5% gotcha. position size. Okay. Uh, Cause then even if you're stopped out with a 5% stop, uh, you're, you're not losing much. So it protects your confidence there and, and gives you, uh, gives you wiggle room to kind of keep on going. So 
Uh, I'll start with a 5% position size. If two out of three trades start working, then I'll, I'll ramp it up to 8%, 10%, 12.5%. Uh, and then 15% is kind of for special cases. Um, you know, uh, PLTR was a name that I considered true market leader quality, you know, uh, really strong growth, uh, momentum trend off lows. Uh, you know, it fits the theme as well. So that type of name is what I'll start with, you know, higher size when I've already got some traction going, market feedback is good. Um, and I, I built up some cushion already. You factor in the ATR of the individual name when you're deciding how big a position you will take. Yeah, I do. Um, Arm uh, is a name I just put on today, um, and that's a recent IPO. I'll bring up that chart here. And IPOs are more volatile by their nature, so I only put on an 8% uh, position here. Uh, so I don't have a, a formula that specifically says, you know, how much should you position size, but um, I like to have a little bit of balance. Adobe is kind of my slow mover in this in this portfolio. Uh, I know a lot of the others can can really move. Uh, so I do take that into account in, in terms of, uh, you know, I won't just put uh, 25% in a recent IPO that can easily, you know, these, these things can really move both to the upside and downside. Well, if you're, uh, if you said you're more conservative by nature, you've uh, gone to evolve to the point where you can trust your system enough to be able to put on some of those bigger sizes, because those, those are some pretty big positions. Yeah. What? I'm I'm also managing risk pretty tightly. Exactly. With yep. Three percent. You know, four percent is kind of my max stop. I would say so. That gives me the confidence that I know even if it reverses on me, it, it's not going to be a huge deal uh, to my account. Nice to see some follow through lately after a, a bunch of the chop we've been through so far this year. For sure. So, uh, any other charts you want to take a look at? Yeah, so uh, PLTR uh, is a name pretty similar, um, gap up, consolidation. Uh, I bought this pretty early in the day, and then I added uh, through the prior day high, um, and th this has been working nicely. I definitely wanted to be in this one. Uh, I had tried it here, and I, I think I, I had a negligible trade here with my last uh, position, uh, but after the earnings gap, it really showed something special again. So that's pretty similar to the Dash trade. So I also want to show Spotify. Uh, this is more VCP type where we've got a consolidation. We get tighter on the right-hand side. Uh, I bought it as it pushed through this kind of mini flag here. Ideally, it can press against the 21 EMA. We didn't quite get there with this name, um, but uh, this is one of the first names that I put on and uh, managed risk against the lows. Then as it continued to push higher, and after today, I moved my stop up to this low, uh, which ideally the 21 EMA kind of comes through, and, and I switched that over to, to being my stop. What's the maximum size you would you would get comfortable with having in a single position? And that now granted that you know you're making you're taking profits uh, as things go higher, so you're sitting on a cushion. Yeah. As of right now, probably uh, twenty percent is the max size I would feel comfortable with. Uh, too much more than that, I, I find the emotions get in the way. And yeah, you know, yep. the, the, these type of names can gap down uh, with a secondary, and and who knows what can happen. So. Uh, twenty percent is probably the top, and and it really has to be an A plus tier stock for me to get to that size. Um, yeah, probably fifty percent. Also, go, go back, go back to that pound to your chart if you yeah. don't mind. You mentioned uh, uh, that you got stopped out on that pullback. I, that's exactly what happened to me. And what we were dealing with then was that last that third leg down. In uh, and they were they were three quick legs, but that uh, that ten to twelve percent pullback that we had in the market that was that failed because the the winds were not at our back, they were in our face, and then things changed uh, on eleven one with the gap up, and you can see that nice. What was the date of that gap up on Palantir? Oh, sorry, probably on eleven one or eleven two. Yep, the second. Yeah, a lot of yep. lot of the games, uh, a lot of names were gapping up right here, and yeah, if, if I bring up the cues. This was kind of the expectation breaker in the market where, um, you know, FOMC and then uh, great yep. action and then continuation. Uh, so this is the second where a lot of games, uh, names were gapping up. And, and this is really, this is the day kind of the trend switched to up uh, kind of in how I interpret things. And then that uh, other gap on the far right side of the chart, that was CPI finally coming in uh, with some decent news and uh, some buyers piling in. And it, you can almost see the FOMO in the indexes 
uh, on that, people that are underinvested at that time. But of course, we've still got the unrepentant bears, fortunately, telling us how dumb we are to uh, be buying the strength in the market. But uh, like I said before, we always want uh, want them there because you can't have everybody uh, on one side of the boat. Yeah, this is this has been so strong, and you know, no give back really on this gap up. It's it's been cool to see. And today uh, we're doing this uh, Monday. Uh, what, what's the date here? It's the eleven twenty. Eleven twenty, and we've had this nice move. So uh, we'll see how things end out uh, the the shorter week today or, or this week. But uh, constructive action across the board. I mean, throughout this entire move, you know, I thought we were going to pull back to twenty one EMA a little bit after this this day. We were at a kind of natural resistance point but expectation breaker the next day i think that was the 10th yeah uh and then yeah that that up. red bar that red bar right before that that was the week bond market uh auction at one o'clock eastern time and we had a big reversal there uh not a lot of demand for 30-year treasuries but uh when you see something negative uh and then you have like you said the positive expectation breaker that next day and then today there was a 20-year a bond auction that was well-received and that uh, added a little bit of fuel to the fire to the upside. So, so many crosswinds in the market between geopolitical and uh, inflation and uh, the Fed balance sheet. But uh, the, they say the market climbs a wall of worry. There's uh, certainly a lot to worry about. But uh, the market now seems to be pricing in uh, rate cuts next year and no more rate increases. So, uh then again, you know, there's people that say that that's bearish, but uh, what do we know? We're just going to follow price and volume and um, what the market tell us what to do. And Tate tells all, exactly. Yep. Rich, I think that's uh, about everything that I've got on my list. Do you uh, have any comments to wrap things up? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, also mention a few losers just because I, I like balancing it out a little bit. Uh, DKNG, I bought this day, then got stopped at the next day, and look what it's done since. Um, so, yeah, I, I should have been more on top of it the next day. I was I was traveling a little bit as well, so that came into play. Uh, Duolingo as well, I exited on on this day for just over break even. I, this is one that I bought on the day two. Uh, I'm still watching this one, plan to get in. I like the story of this name, but uh, yeah, these are some recent uh, losses. Anet, I bought this upside reversal on uh, the 9th then we had a gap down got stopped in the morning um and vrt i bought just a, a day early uh we pushed through this pivot i was watching and then I reconfirmed the next day and i was focused on uh that that was the 10th year there was the expectation breaker and i was focused on other names so didn't get back in this one but uh you know i, I think it's always good to show some losers as well um not just the ones that worked good point uh, also, you mentioned uh, those stocks. How, and then this is getting back to psychology again. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself shying away from taking another swing at those after you've been stopped out? Not, not necessarily the same stock. Um, for me, there were other names that were more promising than this one. Uh, so for me, I kind of always am judging. You know, what's the quality? What's the potential of a stock? Um, definitely if, if there's one day where I get stopped out of three names, I feel that a little bit. Uh, but in this case, you know, some were working, some weren't working. Um, so I was able to, it, it didn't, it didn't hurt my psyche too much. And, um, I always recognize I'm managing risk pretty tightly. Um, so even if I get stopped out, it, it's, it's not the end of the world, but if, if it happens multiple times in a row, um, not only is that market feedback telling me to slow down, but, uh, that's when it can impact things a little bit more. Well, you also mentioned uh, more attractive names at, at, at Revere. We keep uh, in my videos, I keep a 21 over 21 leaders list. And that's basically 21 stocks uh, in uh, over their 21 day exponential moving average and running weekend scans. When we were in that third leg down, we had uh, less than 100 in the entire uh, liquid universe that we look at, which is about a thousand stocks. Yeah. Uh, that stayed over their 21 day exponential moving average. And in the scans over this past weekend, there's been over 500. So uh, definitely a target rich environment. Good to see it for a change. And um, we never know what the market's going to do. Uh, expectations, but not predictions is uh, one of the things I like to say. Yeah, for sure. Um, we'll have to see how things close. Let me bring back uh, the cues just to show that. But 
Uh, yeah, we'll see how things progress from this point, but things are looking strong. But I always remember we're going to retest the 21 EMA at some point and the 50, 50 SMA at some point. So uh, just got to keep that in the back of mind. Uh, Rye, something that he said to me, um, I think a year ago now that was really helpful is, you know, when you've got a stock that's in good profits, uh, he almost thinks of his profit as his cost basis is a 21 EMA. He's not watching so much the price action going up here fluctuations. As long as the stock is respecting the 21 EMA, it's acting right. And uh, that helps the psych psychological aspect as well, because you're not dealing so much in the daily fluctuations in P&L if you're watching what is the 21 EMA doing? What, what's, your, what's your cost versus that doing versus what was the stock doing all the way up here? That's another frame of mind that hopefully, you know, might help some people out. Very good point. So how do you like uh, the market opening at 630 uh, Pacific time? <laughs> I, I know yeah. being on the East Coast, I could not handle that. Yeah, uh, thankfully, I'm a bit of a morning person. So it, it's it's not the end of the world. But, uh, you know, I would like one more hour. I'll, I'll say that. Um, I'll bet. Yeah. So, gro so growing up on the East Coast, how did you yeah. end up in uh, in Seattle? Oh, it, it, was, it was a number of factors. I kind of wanted uh, a, a new start and uh, somewhere where there's some great, you know, hiking and, and stuff to do outdoors. And Seattle definitely fits the bill. Uh, it was kind of between Denver, Boulder and, and Seattle. I kind of uh, settled on here, but I can't complain. I, I did a lot of national parks uh, this past summer. Uh, you know, there's so much stuff around here. North Cascades, Olympic, uh, went up to Alaska with a friend, uh, Yosemite as well. So um, yeah, that's something that I really enjoy, and and uh, definitely Seattle's a, a prime spot to to be your home base for that. Fantastic, except for that one hour of sunshine a day that you're limiting your dog to. Well, but the, other than that, the summers are beautiful. So um, yeah, we we take what we can get. We do, Richard. I really appreciated it. Uh, really enjoyed this. I've, I've had, uh, you know, a lot of questions about how you, how you and the team were, uh, have progressed over the years, you know, watching somebody from afar on Twitter versus actually being able to talk to them and uh, get some questions answered was, uh, certainly something I was, uh, I'm glad to, to, uh, have taken advantage of with you. So thanks for that. Yeah. Th thanks for the time. And, and, uh, I'm definitely more at ease on the other side of the mic asking the questions. So uh, hope, hopefully people got some value about the, uh, out of this. And uh, uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun, Don. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, I've never been on this side of the mic either. So uh, hopefully we, uh, we were able to come through it unscathed. Yeah. And Richard, something I always wrap up my videos with, I'll wrap this up uh, too. And it's something that we certainly touched on several times throughout uh, this interview, that it's not how much you've made in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. So right now we're in the how much can you make with the healthy market, um, but we've got our rules to keep us uh, out of trouble if things uh, switch up. So, yeah, absolutely. And and one one last thing that uh, Jim Ropel's really instilled on me, and this is a key takeaway from talking with him, is uh, you know if you if you think about how many years you've got left to trade and and all of that, the the career you've got left, uh, there's going to be so many opportunities that uh, you can execute on. Uh, so many different market leaders that you can you can catch uh, that really you just have to stay in the game and uh, and protect protect yourself from really serious drawdowns. And if you can do that, there'll be periods like this where uh, things are going well, where you can make progress. But like you said, you got to protect yourself when conditions change and they can change pretty quickly um, and have to have sell rules to protect your capital, both financial as well as your mental capital. Jim's about one of the most optimistic people you'll ever meet. And I don't yeah. ever see an, an interview with him or hear him speak that I don't want to run through a wall after yeah. listening to him. So uh, always good advice coming from him. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think we'll wrap it up. So thanks so much. And uh, we'll get this uh, published uh, hopefully by Thanksgiving Day. And yep. that'll be since there's no market action, maybe some people before they uh, – watch football or stuff themselves can uh, absorb this and uh, take something away from it. So thanks again. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks everybody. All right. Take care.